Uh, first, I'll call the meeting to order. First, our business is Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, of America the Republic, and to the Republic for which it stands, one under the nation, under God, 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 under Okay, next order. Pardon my questions, but I don't have a screen. Is Joel on the call yet? I would guess that's a no. I I made an assumption. Uh, no. Is Tom got, Sullivan on the call yet? Uh, well. Yes, I'm here. Pardon? Okay. I know Bill Phelan is. Neil, are you on the call? Yes, he is. Great. So only, we, the only one we don't know about yet is Joel. Joel's on. Great. Sounds good to me. Uh, we just finished the pledge, uh, and I will ask for a, you know, uh, be, be, before I do that, just revealing the rules of the road. If we can try to speak individually, uh, if we can try to keep our devices muted except when we want to speak, uh, it would probably work out better. Uh, and if, if, if those of us who, who came in via video, uh, Tony can go ahead and mute us if we get too rowdy uh, because he's the administrator. But other than that, uh, those of you who are on the landlines, if you would keep your phones muted uh, unless you want to speak. so. With that in mind, uh, we will move on. Then next order of business is uh, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second, second All, those, All those in favor of approving the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Aye, stands voting unanimously. Next order of business is discussion and action. Uh, this would be approval of the director's report for the month of May. Is there a motion to approve, sir? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Joel. Okay. Um, Rick, if you are on, if you would be so kind as to, you know, if anybody has any questions uh, with regard to that, uh, the electric water or sewer. Is there, anything, here, Mr. Chairman. is there anything in particular that you'd like to highlight first, I guess I should say? Um, I hadn't prepared any remarks. Okay, that's okay. I just figured I'd, I, I would give you the opportunity. Uh, any questions, gentlemen, of, of the director or of either of the general managers? Uh, well, just a, an observation. Um, I, I, again, I, I just had an opportunity to sort of pull up on my screen the, the May report uh, compared to the June report. You know, a lot of duplication of, of, of information there, uh, but not a mention uh, of agenda item nine, uh, which I would have loved to have seen some, some information from you uh, regarding agenda item number nine. So I, I guess my, just my, my, my views on this would be I would I would much prefer have a now have we gone through this new agenda this new method of going through and raising questions I, I would much prefer to have focused micro information on some hot button issues that may be the subject matter of uh, the meeting uh, versus just a in many ways regurgitation of information that is being provided by Neil. Tony. So that's that's views, my views of today, having taken a, a considerable amount of time of going line by line with uh, two directors reports for the months of May and June. Okay. All right. Uh, Patrick, I believe you're referring to the director's report that was approved in May for April. That's correct. Okay. The, la the last director's report. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the director's report is presented here and signified by saying aye. 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 
All right, stands voted unanimously. Next order of business. Um, this would be a discussion and action approval of electric vehicle project. Uh, well, I guess you're on unless you want to tee it up uh, either uh, Rick or Tony. I, I, I can provide you some that. Yeah, please go ahead, Walt. Since you're leaving, we'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Director uh, Hendershot. Uh, so this is something that, that we've been discussing uh, within uh, the department for, for some period of time, how to approach uh, electric vehicles. And this company, uh, Fleet Karma, was introduced to us by uh, Energy New England. And it's in uh, when looking at the, this proposal, and I, I hopefully that, that you folks have the the uh, my uh, brief uh, summary in front of you. Uh, it seems to be a very cost-effective way for us to to first start and gather some intelligence to see how what we anticipate as the growth in electric vehicles within our territory and how we can gain a better sense today how people what their charging behavior is and if if we need to somehow take another uh, strategy to change people's behavior if that's uh, adversely impacting our uh, uh, transmission and capacity peaks. So that is, uh, so there's just to briefly, so Fleet Karma is, is a company uh, out of Ontario, Canada. They provide a, a piece of uh, hardware and um, it's called a C2 device. It plugs into the diagnostics port of an EV vehicle, and uh, this is a very much uh, a customer-driven type of program where the, where the customer would sign in through uh, their portal and sign up for the program. This C2 device, which is uses cellular technology to transmit the data, they send it directly to the customer. The customer self-installs it, and so it's, it's, it's very much uh, an interaction between the customer and Fleet Karma. Uh, one of the benefits that we see that we'll be able to see the data of of each participant in this uh, pilot program if if the um, commission so approves, and we'll, and after a year, we're ho hopefully we'll have a a very good picture to see how our current uh, EV owners within Wallingford how they're charging their vehicles and whether there's uh, and then we can plan forward from there how to uh, address those behaviors if, if we find that they are having an uh, adverse impact on our uh, peak periods. Just uh, And just to, uh, then there's a, a second a piece to it. So um, Energy New England also ha has been having a uh, educational and awareness uh, program for EV vehicles. I'm uh, looking through my notes now. I think there's something in, in the range of uh, 15 to 20 uh, Massachusetts municipals that are currently participating in this E&E EV electric vehicle education awareness uh, program. So it, it has had some um, you know, once again, other uh, municipalities have, have been participating in it, and I believe they've, they've seen the success on educating customers regarding charging behaviors and so forth and how they can. Um, and once again, they have an incentive program, but that's something I think that, that will, is we're not ready to do yet. We first need to gather the data using the Fleet Karma uh, technology and the Energy New England uh, program is to help market or because they're willing to put on, they're willing to sponsor a separate website where, where customers can uh, reach out and, and ask questions about um, specific items about uh, electric vehicles. So there's two components to, the, to this um, pilot. Is, is there uh, anything that. A couple things to what Walter said. Uh, Energy New England has hired a full-time electric vehicle program coordinator because there's demand for the services from most of their clients, largely the Massachusetts municipal light plants, who unlike here in Connecticut are not 
required to do any energy conservation and load management programs, but voluntarily do some or several in, I think their point of view is if if we if we do things voluntarily, we might not be have it imposed upon us. So there there was a market in Massachusetts for these services. Energy New England reacted to it, and in concert with this, Walter and I, with the help of others from the Electric Division staff, looked at many other alternatives to how to address the possible negative load shape impacts of electric vehicle charging and, and how to properly measure it and, and treat customers. We were looking at different metering technologies and, and such, and there, there wasn't anything that was terribly user-friendly. And we didn't want to have to staff up to, to do something like this. And uh, then this opportunity from Energy New England uh, came our way. So that's, that's what's prompted what we've presented this evening. Okay. Uh, Patrick or Joel, do you have any questions uh, that you'd like to bring up at this time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Joel. Uh, uh, if you're uh, looking to entertain some comments, I would be uh, pleased to make a, 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 a couple of very brief comments. Please do. So uh, it's, it's my opinion that uh, here's an opportunity for increased deployment of clean transportation. It's good for the environment. It's good for uh, health. Uh, health of our residents and, and the market for uh, these electric vehicles uh, appears to me to be both economically and technically feasible. I think I think these I think the electric vehicles are coming. Uh, moreover, uh, I like the proactive approach here that uh, seeks to identify what the impact will be to the electric system, and that is um, there's a, uh, an assessment of, of loads uh, based on a, a projection of vehicle sales, and uh, for us, uh, it, it's uh, for us not to look at this nearly two million kilowatt hours. Uh, I think would be a, a mistake. So uh, uh, to the extent that we would be uh, seeking a, a pragmatic approach to um, uh, how to manage this this 1.9 million kilowatt hours, this uh, 1855 uh, kilowatt peak load uh, is good. So not only do we, we get clean transportation, uh, we'll be able to manage the electric uh, supply and distribution system. Uh, and potentially come up with uh, the data to better understand protection of our system and uh, perhaps with the uh, um, uh, method for rate design, where and how to uh, manage the, the loads uh, as an off-peak load from these vehicles, or for the vehicle charging. Uh, last, I, I also want to comment on the price. I think the 12, 12, uh, 150 is extremely reasonable. And um, I would support the um, the bid waiver in that uh, we know that the um, uh, the connection between um, a company that we've worked with uh, currently uh, is um, uh, a quality company, and um, uh, I, I I think it's uh, would be a wise move to move forward on this uh, without delay. So I would uh, support the program and also support the the bid waiver. Patrick, any comments, sir? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I just want to echo uh, Mr. Reinbold's uh, comments and sentiment. Uh, I, I hats off to Wed, uh, Rick, Tony, um, and Walt for advancing this, getting ahead of the curve. The, the, the bar graph on page 5.4 speaks for itself. Again, concur wholly with Joel. I mean, this is coming. And it's a great way for us to uh, begin the measurement process for planning. Um, I also concur with uh, with Joel uh, for uh, exp expressing support 
for the bid waiver, uh, and I think that the, the numbers they, they seem quite reasonable, and the fact that this is a warm handoff from ENE also uh, permits me to take comfort in the, the next steps. The question that I have, Mr. Chair, is in light of of the impending retirement of Walt, um, how are we going to, and, and the fact that that spot may not be filled in quickly, uh, or backfilled quickly, certainly the shoes cannot be filled quickly. Um, how we go about taking this to, to advancing this quickly and keeping tabs on it or managing it in the short term. Well, I'm not going to try to answer that one. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, Rick, that's or, a question, Patrick. Um, will, to a large extent, I'll, all I can say is we'll figure it out as we go along. We'll get a lot of help from Energy New England in this in that, uh, like I said, they've got a dedicated electric vehicle program administrator uh, on their staff now. I also so, know, I, I thought, I, this is Patrick Bruni, I, I thought I saw something in one of the memos about how we're gonna publicize this, but I, I can't put my finger on it now. And so just, just how are we, this is one of those, this is one of those programs that we should be touting. We should be talking to the press. This is very impressive. And how are we going to go about letting our consumers know that this is going to be up and running? So um, on, on page 5.5 .5 of the report under pilot program implementation, the last okay. uh, paragraph under that section, um, that's where, that's probably where you saw it. Um, it. You talk about the marketing of the pilot program will be initiated by us, the WED, through Bill Stuffers, the quarterly newsletter, and other low-cost alternatives prior to enlisting E&E for an additional and potentially more expensive public outreach effort. So we're, we're going to start internally, and then as we get more data and this thing, you know, progresses, uh, you know, then we'll we'll enlist E&E for support. Thank you. My suggestion with regard to that, in addition to that, uh, Tony, would be to uh, <clears throat> once this bid waiver is approved by the town council, which hopefully will be next week, what I would suggest is that uh, we put together a uh, <clears throat> news, you know, a press release noting that this is going to be or. or when it's going to be available to us now. It may be too early at this point until we have the equipment in hand. But I think it you know I think it would be worthwhile to go ahead and put out a press release on that in addition to the bill stuff was you know you know, you know et cetera. That's just that's just a thought. Uh, other than that I well, do that's have a good one, here. Mr. Chairman. And Pardon? I think um, since They've done this for other systems. I suspect a lot of this is already in the can at ENE. At &E. um, uh -huh. They just need to change the name of the utility. And there's probably a lot of materials that have been used other places that would be applicable here with, with, with a little bit of editing. No, that would make, that would make sense to me, there, Rick, uh, on that. But I mean, I, th I think that's something to think about. And as I say, if so many this goes through, we notify E and E that you know that we're ready to roll, and then see about doing that at the appropriate time, uh, because I think that you know that'll give us some coverage. Uh, I would also well, suggest I would also suggest that it might get put up on the uh, web page, you know, town's web page, and you know, in our section. Uh, that that being another means of potentially getting it out there. If we had a Facebook page, I'd say that too, but I know we don't. And and Tony's Tony's got a point he wants to bring up. Yeah, one one of the I, this is to respond to Patrick's question earlier on about you know uh, with Walt's retirement and uh, you know the time it may take to backfill his position. Walt has uh, graciously agreed to 
uh, work with us on a part-time basis uh, until that happens, and and also when that happens in um, working with his successor to you know fill the shoes, uh, like you said. So um, we will be we look forward to continue working with Walt, you know, on a part-time basis to to keep things progressing. Terrific. Now, Bob Walmart again. That that's that sounds good. It'll ease the transition and be able to get the program going. All right. With that in mind, the only question I had with regard to that uh, chart on page five dash four. There really are about a hundred uh, EVs in uh, the territory that we're aware of. Or, or yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that a uh, best, best estimate at this point? Uh, Bob, a walk. What I did is I reached out to the assessor's office, and uh, they provided me a, a list of vehicles registered in Good. in Wallingford. And what I did is I, I sorted through the list by uh, car type, and um, I also went through to some other sources to get a list of what electric vehicles are currently being manufactured, and I compared the two lists. So I, I feel pretty confident the hundred or so uh, vehicles currently registered is an accurate number. Yeah. I figured you'd done your homework on it, but uh, I just wanted to I just wanted to go ahead and worry about it because it just seemed to me like it more than yeah I know I happen to know myself of literally one person who had who has one I, and I know she happens to be ecstatic about it practically but uh, uh, but anyway, no. All right. Is there a motion to uh, waive the, you know, to recommend the the waiving of the bid on on this uh, project? Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the reasons stated in the memoranda uh, and uh, on the record tonight, I make a motion to to approve the bid waiver. Is there a second to that? Second by Joe. Okay. Uh, all, then is, is there any additional discussion, gentlemen? That hearing none, all those in favor of Mr. Bernie's motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Stands voted unanimously. Okay. Next order of business is discussion and possible action with regard to the PCA adjustment. Uh, that being item number six here, uh, Tony or. If Rick, whichever one would like to, to go ahead and take it. Well, first I'll ask the three of this is Rick. I'll ask the three of you. Uh, did you receive Tom Sullivan's email from late this afternoon, around quarter after four or so? Uh, this is Dr. I Bernie. Did. I, I did receive it. I Bob or Joel, did you receive it? Yes, I did. Okay, I, I'd like to emphasize that what Tom's done there is that at the 11th hour provided the memo that he would have provided had we been doing this in the first meeting in July. All of the data has finally come in and he could write the memo that he would have written two weeks from now uh, under more typical circumstances. And in so doing, he's updated and uh, improved the analysis, and it's resulted in an even larger credit. And you'll, you gentlemen recall, Mr. Reinbold via email earlier today asked about this issue, and I'll remind all of us that um, rate 12, which is the WED rate that describes the PCA, uh, calls for or enables, or maybe allows is the best word, um, the, the PUC to adjust the PCA if its magnitude is greater than a half a cent, if the, if the change in PCA is greater than a half a cent. Right. Now, admittedly, the intent of that provision was when PCAs were charges, and if, if it rose by more than half a cent and the, the commission wanted to ameliorate that, it provides that power. But here, what it what's happened is the magnitude of the credit has increased by more than half a cent. Uh, so the, the commission could adjust the, the, this credit, this negative PCA if it wished to, 
staff is not advising that, but the numbers do stand on their own and speak for themselves. Okay, uh, Bob Beaumont here. Um, firstly, I did not receive an email from uh, Tom Sullivan today. Tom, um, what do you have to say for yourself? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> He just uh, telling us. Yeah, I, I, I believe you were copied. I believe you were copied in. Maybe one of the commissioners could check their emails. I don't have it in front of me, but I guess that email, email contained. The last email I have from you is last is back in I believe September of last year. <laughs> That's a while. The uh, email that's <laughs> Please, I'm, look, I'm looking at it, Bob, and you worked. You it was to you and to Patrick and to Joel, okay. and he copied Tony. And that was today or yesterday? Today at four seventeen is when I got mine. I got nothing. I just, yeah, you just sent me straight to junk mail. <laughs> I re I, I just reset I reset it to you, Bob. Pardon? I re I just forwarded it to you. Re forwarded okay. it to you. Okay. What it states is with the bringing in the actual values that we have at this point, the PCA would be a negative 0 0.013159. Previous memo had it at a negative 0 0.011442. Okay. Those numbers are in dollars. So both those instances, it was greater exactly. than a penny. But now it's yes. Tom. Now it's negative 1.3 cents and change, and it was negative 1.1 cent and change, correct? Tom, are you there? In the last calculation, yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I can. Right. So what we need from the commission is just approval of Tom's most recent calculation of, and Tom, if you could recite the number precisely. Yeah. Okay. The, the number for Wallingford customer would be a, ne a PCA of a negative 0 0.013159 or 1.3 cents. Um, left alone with no action, the PCA will just take effect as of, you know, based on the rate 12 cal calculation. But. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. That I believe would equate to uh, like for the average customer uh, at 750 kWh of about $7.81 a month less or a seven a change. A seven dollar change from the uh, June right. bill from where we are today. Right. Okay. I've just received uh, a text Chair? from Tony. He's, excuse me, this is Rick. I've just received a text from Tony. He and I are in different rooms. He says he can't hear anyone. Um, I'm going to, he may jump in at some point and interrupt us inadvertently. Just wanted to alert everybody that Tony can't hear us. Hmm. Don't know why. I mean, as, as the administrator, he should have, well, he should have control over all of us, but uh, yeah, it's strange. That's one I haven't, that's one I haven't run into before, very honestly, at least with the go to meeting. Um, all right, is there, is there a motion uh, to, to approve uh, the numbers that uh, Tom Sullivan has come up with for the PCA? for the next six months. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Patrick Brady. I just, um, do, do we need to take action on this? Because I, it was my understanding rate 12, this would automatically come into effect. I'm not sure that we have That is, have. pardon? Right. The, Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, that, that is true. Rate 12, you know, it's just like, any any other rate you adopted, that effective date comes, it goes into effect unless you took action tonight to make it something different. That's that half cent difference that Rick mentioned. You've got the opportunity, but it's not recommended.
Well, that's fine. I don't, I don't have any problem with, uh, you know, with not taking action. I just, you know, I just, my thought was, it's just to be positive in support of that which you've come up with, but I suppose there's no real need for it. Uh, but I certainly support it. Uh, I think it's, I you know, appreciate the work that you've done, particularly the work you've done today to go ahead and rework your numbers there, Tom. And um, so, yeah, it'll be a slight benefit anyway to, to our customers, you know, in any event at this time. Yes, Patrick. And yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I, again, I, I completely agree with you. Thanks for the work. Thanks for the revised work. Um, and again, I, I, your pleasure, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to make a motion to approve the today, Tom's memo today reflecting what the PCA will be for both Wallingford and, and, and Northford, I certainly could do that. Yeah, I would like to have it on the record just in case anybody questions that, unless Rick has a problem with that. No, I'd prefer yeah, that too, Chairman. Chairman, I'd be pleased to uh, second that motion also. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm in agreement that the uh, the uh, the adjustment is uh, is warranted. We've got um, I've looked at the the cash requirements and the excess over minimum, and uh, I think we would be uh, um, I think it'd be prudent to. Uh, Make this adjustment for the uh, uh, the refund through the PCA. Uh, Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is Patrick Bernie. For the reasons stated in the June 16, 2020 memo from Mr. Sullivan, as well as the reasons stated tonight on the record, I make a motion to uh, affirm the actual PCA calculation for the period from July 2020 to December 2020. Is there a second? Second by Joel. All right. Any additional discussion, gentlemen? Hearing on all those in favor of Mr. Bernie's motion with respect to the PCA, signify by saying aye. 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 Stands voted unanimously. Okay. Next order of business um, would be public question and answer. Are there any questions from the public? Uh, in a way, Mr. Chairman, there are. Uh, we here at the Electric Division received an email from a, cu a customer who's a citizen of Wallingford asking some questions about the the electric vehicle program that we discussed earlier. Um, okay. It's it's a the email is not in just strict questions. There the questions are buried in the content of the email, but I think we can parse them out. Tony was going to do that if it if it pleases the chair. Please do so. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so I'll try to um, summarize the the questions. Um, so. Basically, uh, thought the um, proposal was very interesting. Um, commends us for looking ahead, um, and that they would they would participate as a family. Um, looking for, you know, I guess they did some of their own research and found that Fleet Pharma is running something in New York, um, and they talk about. Uh, participation and bonuses uh, and plus rebates for off-peak charging um, and that they couldn't find any incentive in the proposal uh, that we put forward and the proposal we're, we're putting forward as you're all aware is basically to collect the data and do some analysis uh, and, and then you know based on that data I'll recommend uh, pot you know potentially um, a rate or some type of incentive for you know off-peak um, charging so that that's uh, I think the way uh, you know we would answer that question. Um, then the you know, they talked about um, is it only aimed at residential customers, um, and what about you know charging stations at you know commercial you know stop and shops, the train stations, Walmart, uh, those types of places. Um, and do we have data for those stations? We we do not um, at this point. Those those service customers. This is more for electric vehicle owners um, and and monitoring their 
their charging habits um, and what the impact is to the system. How, you know, uh, are they charging during peak conditions? What that does to us and, and what we can do to incentivize uh, electric vehicle owners to charge during off-peak um, times. Um, you know, there, there was a question about, um, you know, publicly, publicly available charging is going to be essential for e, uh, EV adoption in the near future. And uh, how can the added peak demand during the day be counterbalanced with public charging uh, and public charging be incentivized? And, you know, again, we're, we're doing this for data collection and to understand um, the habits and, and what it'll do uh, to the grid. And uh, we will look at incentivizing uh, basically to charge off peak. Um, and there was another question about the state's GHG emission reduction mandate and more renewable energy in the power uh, generation mixed project. Um, the relation between and the timing of supply and demand will probably change as well. What is WED's approach to load management by A, increasing power supply during peak demand, summer afternoon with renewable energy generation and storage and um, time of use rates that could be adjusted as these changes occur. Can we quickly explain why alternative metering and other software solutions would not be economical, economically viable? Um, I don't know that there's a quick answer there, Rick, and you can, you can chime in, but um, you know, those options, those options have yeah. been looked in the past. Um, uh, and right now, to put that infrastructure in place uh, requires a significant, um, you know, investment, um, and uh, doesn't look like it would provide uh, the return uh, on that um, with with the size of the utility um, that we are. Um, it would certainly increase um, headcount, and we would need increased computing power to do um, significant analysis in order to make that. Um, investment in payback for us. Um, Rick, I don't know if I missed anything, but. No, you, you basically hit it, Tony. I'll just fill in a couple of blanks. The, um, the, the, the gist of the question revolves around the concept of time of use rate, which requires time of use metering and time of use billing. Um, and those efforts are not for the faint of heart. Quite some time ago, we looked into the cost of the metering infrastructure to accomplish this. And as what Tony talked about, the increase of the head count, that has to do mostly with data manipulation and, and administration. And so what one would do since you're going to have to replace all the meters is you want to go full-blown AMI, automated metering infrastructure, which would then involve the communications infrastructure for the to be able to pull the meters and thus reduce head count that way um, and we we looked hard at it and it was very serious money also time of use rates can be risky if you don't get them right you will grossly over or pos uh, grossly under or possibly over collect because your rate structure won't exactly match the the shape and structure of your cost. It's, it's, it's difficult to do well. And um, so we have not done it to this point for those reasons and this electric vehicle issue and the need to, with our eyes wide open, attempt to manage the impact of electric vehicle charging on our electric system and underlying cost structure uh, doesn't change those those financial administrative realities of um, what's needed to properly do time of use rates. So that's what I would say in, in addressing those questions. Again, like Tony said, it can't be answered quickly. I did the best I could. <laughs> No, I, I know when we looked at uh, the time of use rates here a few years ago that it, you know the <clears throat> the capital cost would have been significant to begin with, uh, and let alone the, you know any operational 
issues. There, there are some pluses and minuses op, operationally, as you noted. Uh, that's a, maybe a related issue, but it's a, it's something you know not really involved directly with this. In, in, in addition, we're, we're also getting some very, very competitive rates for uh, for load following generation. So that I mean, that, that just even makes it more uh, of a challenge to make a program like that work. <laughs> That's a good point, uh, Joel. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, any other questions from the public uh, at this point in time? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. If you would identify this yourself is... and, uh, you know, name and address, um, and we'll go, we'll go from there. Steve Gale. Whiskey Wynn Wallingford. My question pertains to the program we just approved for the bid waiver. So what's the, if you, if time of day rates are kind of like out of the question, what's the point of the program then? Well, the program would be cruder than just time of day rates, Steve. What, the way it would work if, if, we, if we did something, if the analysis shows that there's something to be done, we envision it something along the lines of we would a few times a month through Energy New England identify impending likely peak moments and notify um, electric vehicle customers or, or maybe make it even simpler and just carve out certain times of day where we did not want them to charge and and monitor their behavior and provide some sort of likely financial incentive. Do not charge during these times of days. History shows that this is always when our monthly transmission peaks and our annual capacity peaks are set and and then reward customers that stay away from those times. Okay, so if you're going to do that for an EV customer, why not do that for like residential customers so they don't want their dryer during that peak time? Well, here we've again, <laughs> it would be how do we measure that? How do we measure compliance? In this instance, there's a there's a turnkey solution, an already available piece of hardware that plugs into an electric vehicle that will tell us when that car was charging. It will buy cellular technology report its findings and a third party will manipulate the data and provide us um, information on this. It, what you just described like, like, like dryers or home appliances or even businesses and industry require meters and we have to do all of what I just described for ourselves and it gets back to the investment in the infrastructure. Well, I'm guessing because the the meter also, so it would be similar to the same thing, right? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear most of that. I, I said that charging an electric vehicle requires a meter too. Yes, but the 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 device that's in the car will tell us when the car was charging. We're not going to meter the car charger separately. We will we will poll the car to learn when it was charging, and we we can learn the charging rate of individual cars, and that will we'll be able to infer the energy that was used during those periods of time. But the point is, it's sort of a go no go. Your car was charging or it was not in the times involved. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. Any other questions? Uh Hearing none, I will declare that the uh, public question and answer period is over, and we will move on. Um, I would normally say, uh, Tony, you could leave if you like, but in as much as you're administrator, you don't have you don't have that luxury, I guess. Uh, but uh, 
We'll move on to uh, water and sewer then. Item number seven, uh, discussion and action, set a date and time for a public hearing for the water and sewer division rate changes. Um, Neil, uh, if you would. Uh, Take center stage on that. I'd appreciate it. Hello, Neil. Trying to get his PowerPoint up and going, I think. Am I correct? I see your mouth moving, but I don't see... Uh, and I don't hear anything, Neil. Neil, you know, try your uh, removing your mute button. It looks like he's on, but uh... can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I see Neil on, and I gave him presenter rights, but I cannot hear him. And I don't have a cell number for him, so I don't know how to reach him at home. I'm trying to, I'm reaching him right now via cell phone. He, he had issues with this last time, and for some reason, go to meeting through his computer he's had issues with in the past he's going to dial in like i had to do oh, you got him tony yes he's he's working on dialing in now Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You got to turn off the audio on the computer. Okay, there you go. Yes, I did. So GoToMeeting is the only web platform that I have issues with. So um, after last week, after last month, I tried Zoom. I tried Collaborate. It's GoToMeeting. Hold on one second here, please. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, can everyone see the PowerPoint on the screen, please? Can do so. Yes. Okay, all right, so the, okay, so the last time we presented this to the Public Utilities Commission was March 17th. Um, we had actually moved forward to looking at a public hearing date and then the COVID-19 pandemic um, really took hold and we were unable to continue with group gatherings. So uh, this is a bit of a refresher for um, where we stand. We have a few rate increases primarily focusing on the cost per CCF or the cost per um, 
100 cubic feet. So with that, we will just go through the presentation, which was also provided to you this evening um, with the packet. Yeah, Neil, if you can read off page numbers, I'd appreciate it because I'm not at a screen. Okay, uh, page two. All right, hold on, then I got to coordinate here. Seven twenty one, I believe. Right. Yeah, so, okay, so I there's a lot going on on my side and the go to meeting. I, I don't have full access to my screen because of the pop ups of go to meeting, I can't collapse them. So, page seven to one, uh, here's the workshop agenda. We'll just go over the historical sewer division billable usage. Um, the green chart we've seen several times. We will go over the historical sewer division rate. Uh, I want to review the number of sewer customers by meter size and class, and then um, review the sewer division financial commitments. Flipping to page 7 22, updated proposed sewer division usage rate. We'll look at the updated quarterly increase by meter size and class, focusing on fiscal year 21, what the next steps of the process are, and then what the discussion and then uh, discussion and questions. So moving on to page 7-23 of your packet. Um, here is historical sewer billable usage, um, fiscal year one to projected through June 30 of this year. So in the fourth quarter of this financial fiscal year um, is projected. So you can see we continue on a downward trend. Switching to page 7-24, historical sewer division rates. So the second column, um, we have the usage rate. I'm getting feedback here. And then, uh, then we have the base service fee specifically for the 5 8 inch meter. Switching to page 7-25, you can see through the orange boxes the cumulative usage rate between June 2005 to June 2013. Cumulative increase, just as a point of reference, was 81.66%, and the base service fee between June 2005 through June of 2012 went up at cumulative 147.56%. So we just put that in there for context. Switching to page 7-26, here is the number of sewer customers. And you may recall from three months ago, uh, we are going to focus on our 5 8 inch meter customer. We have nearly 96% of our customers in the, in the sewer system are 5 8 inch meter, and that includes 904 flat rate single family dwellings. So, and if you look at the Cumulative quantity of 5 eighths, 3 quarter, and 1 inch meters, they account for slightly more than 98% of our customers. So switching to 7-27, you can see the larger 1 and a half, 2, 3, and 4 inch meters. There's a quantity of 245 in the entire system com compared for those size meters compared to 12,747 total meters. So these one and a half inch and greater meters 
account for less than 2% of all our sewer customers. Switching to page 7-28, just want to review the sewer, sewer division current financial commitments. So we do have our water pollution control facility upgrades project, uh, $55.8 million interim funding obligation with the state. And then if you look at the five-year sewer division capitals project, we do have the I-91 pump station, Force Main, and the Durham Road gravity sewer. We have the fine screens at the wastewater treatment plant solid handling at the wastewater treatment plant, electrical upgrades at the wastewater treatment plant. We will continue with our collection system lining. In fisc proposed in fiscal year 21, CIP budget for the sewer division is North and South Turnpike sanitary sewer upgrades. And of course, uh, we do have vehicles and trucks we try to purchase to a year. Switching to page 7-29, excuse me, <clears throat> you do see some of our annual operating expenses. Labor and wages, excuse me, wages and salaries, overhead including benefits, materials, parts, and equipment, utilities, specifically electric, Nitrogen credit purchases, our RBC repairs, and our inflow and infiltration program. Switching to page 7-30. So let's take a look at the reason for the updated sewer division usage rates or the cost per CCF. So when we delayed implementing the proposed sewer division rates from July 1, 2020 to October 1, 2020, that is a three month delay in collecting the increased sewer rates. So when we take a look at that, that is a, an approximate $107,400 loss. That is revenue that will not be collected. Decrease in investments due to lower interest rates. You may recall that during the budget process, we get this number from the comptroller's office and with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the financial markets have degraded. And so therefore the investment revenue that we traditionally earn will be lower due to lower interest rates. And that's an approximate $173,900 over the four-year rate period presented in front of you. And then the interest on Clean Water Fund loan advances from February 2020, when we received our first loan advance, to September 2022, when we are projecting that we will have our closing with the state. So this is essentially when you go from a construction loan to a long-term mortgage. So this is approximately $998,300. I do want to note that this was included in the town funding ordinance. And for prior to on March 17, we did not wow. have an exact number. Wow. We did not have a number or process from the DEP as to when the interest would start uh, being accrued. We have since learned that, so we need to account for that and start collecting for it in the next four-year rates. So, oops, heavy finger there. Switching to 7-31. For those of you that are following along in the book, um, so this is what the updated proposed rate model looks like. And we can focus on the right-hand portion of your screen. 
And so the red line is our minimum cash reserve balance. And the top of the green line is our ending cash balance. So on March 17th, we presented two rate models to the PUC, one very similar to this and one which we refer to as the skipping the rock model, where the minimum cash reserve balance, the red dotted line and the top of the green columns was essentially the same based on uh, recommendations. From the Public Utilities Commission, we went where there's a bit of a gap between those two. So you put forth the new CCF charges, and this is what the updated proposed rate model looks like. On the left hand side, you can see the large green, excuse me, the large red columns is our operating expenses. So that is the bulk of our. Um, annual operating, but you can see the yellow begin in fiscal year 22. That is our phosphorus debt service. So that is when we convert our construction loan to our long term mortgage, for lack of a better phrase. Moving on to 7 32, for those of you following uh, at home. Neil, it's Patrick. I, I just have a question. If you can go back to 731. And if you could just send me uh, this deck, I have it in black and white, but I don't have it uh, in color. Just send send me this when when we're done, or at some point tomorrow. Just send me this presentation in color so I have it. I, I just think it's important to focus on the uh, seven thirty one, the the color, the left uh, bar chart to to, ref, to to really underscore the fact that there's not. There's not a lot of wiggle room here in terms of what I would view as discretionary spending on the CapEx side. Because I'm, I'm looking at the green sliver and it, and it pales in terms of proportion to the phosphorus debt service as well as the phase two debt service. Um, and, and, you know, when I look, when I look at the, 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 the the drastic increases in the percentage increases is troubling. But when I compare it to what it may be viewed as fixed costs, because we have to undergo the project, and compared to, um, this, if you want to call it discretionary CapEx, and it really isn't discretionary CapEx, it's, it's very small. So there's just, our hands in so many ways are tied with the increased rates. Um, so I appreciate this chart and I appreciate your description of it. It sort of puts everything in perspective. But having said that, if, if you go back to um, 730 and you look at the two um, de uh, delay costs, the 107.4 for the three month delay and the 173.9 for the four year delay, is there, we do have some wiggle room if we needed to. to to eat into discretionary cash retained earnings to cover these delay costs. Is that true? That is that is correct. And I think what I want to do is I can jump ahead. So let's let's take a look at for those following at home, um, I'm gonna flip back here, sorry. We look at seven dash 31 and look at the gap or look at the spacing between the red dotted line and the top of the columns. And then if we look at the prior model, which was, um, for lack of a phrase, endorsed by the Public Utilities Commission, particularly for the four years that we are looking to implement this rate structure, fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 24. You can see that gap is much larger on the dark green columns between our minimum cash reserve balance and so the red dotted line, minimum cash, and then the, our ending cash, which is the top of the columns. So to your point, Patrick, it's hard to see in the PowerPoint, but particularly it, that has the vertical height between those two metrics has decreased. 
So we have looked, we have taken a harder look at our discretionary cash. We actually are using more of the retained earnings to lessen this um, new dollar per CCF, for lack of a better phrase. That's poorly stated, but so we have taken a look at that. We have compressed that vertical height between those two lines to the point where um, Bill Phelan and I went around this several times. Is we do have wiggle room, but I think if we if we compress that any more, then we start to get a little bit nervous. We start to get a little bit of a high pitched squeal, I guess. Uh, cash over minimum gets depleted, gets you squirmy. Is that is that your is that the word you use, squirmy? A squealy, you know, we kind squealy. Of, squealy, you know, it's oh. looking a little tight there. <laughs> okay. So, you know, and I think, and to your point is, you know, when we really, because of the large debt service, the town and the ratepayers are going to take on, we really took a look at what our future, you know, non-recurring cap act projects are. And so you do really see that green compressed, you know. Um, so that is so jumping up so there's seven thirty seven dash thirty one and then we'll go to seven dash thirty two mm -hmm. and you can see the proposed unit rate increase. So and we had to add a second line here because, quite frankly, for fiscal year 21, the first three quarters are at 0%, and then the last nine months or the last three quarters would be at a 9%. So we're looking at the CCF, 9%, 9%, and then a 12.5% increase. Does it just do that right? And then on page 7-33, this continues out fiscal year 24 through fiscal year 29. So those would be the unit rate increases for the model. Uh, Bob Beaumont here. That is presuming that in 24, 5, 6, and 7, or 24, 5, and 6, that we are doing some of the other capital improvements uh, on, if you will, on phase, on phase two, correct? Correct. And so what we have in front of you is a four-year rate model. So we're focusing on fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 24. You know, we have you know, we have projected out where we think we're going to be in fiscal year 25 through fiscal year 29. But when we started this project over a year ago, um, when we brought in a firm to help us build a model, you know, one of the things, one of the things we said was you can go in and change the model. And even in three months, we have changed the model. You know, we, and that was during the budget process as numbers got finalized. The three month delay, that was a conscious decision. You know, did we know the interest rates were gonna plummet? No. You know, we finally got direction on DEP. So the PUC can look at a four-year rate model and then really, you know, I would suggest on a two-year basis, on a biennial basis, go back and just look at the model. But I think once we get out to fiscal year 25 and beyond, Bob, we're doing our best educated guesses but who knows where markets are going to go who knows you know who knows you know we put in a percentage for usage decline could that increase could that decrease we can well, tweak the model then Neil, but yeah I, we I, I i certainly understand that you're doing your best with with regard to it and you know this has been a highly unusual and hopefully never repeatable situation that we've been through here the last three months. 
uh, you know, I, you know, I, I just was, I just wanted to get, get that clarity, you know, clarification on the record. That's all. So. Oh, correct. I, Thank you. I yes, certainly sir. appreciate Thank all, you. again, I certainly appreciate all the work you, Bill, and staff have put in on it, but go ahead and continue if you would, sir. Okay, no, no, thank you for pointing that out. And then again, just as a comparison, moving to 7-34, mm -hmm. here is what was proposed on March 17. Very similar, but you can see in the four-year rate model that we're looking at, fiscal year 21 through 24, the spacing was a bit greater between our minimum cash reserve balance and our ending cash. And then just as a comparison, really for a record, um, we did include what the rate increases would be. So you can see, you know, in fiscal year 21, it was previously 7.5. Now we're proposing nine. So right. jumping ahead, and then you have this in your packet as well. I knew because it might not photocopy, it is the double underline. Sure. So the current rate, which has been in effect since June 1, 2013, so it's been in effect for seven years. We have not touched the rates in seven years. So the, the, middle, the middle bar of the middle row is what we presented just up for your reference on um, March 17. No, I'm sorry. The middle bar is is a clean. The, the middle row is a clean row of what we are presenting this evening. And just for comparison, the bottom row is what we presented on March 17. Sorry about that. So, and then switching to page 7-37. Again, we're going to focus on our three, excuse me, our five eight inch meter customer. So the average quarterly increase for a five eight inch meter customer, if you are single family residential, will be five point two nine Neil quarter. Yes. Neil Patrick Bernie, just a quick question back to seven thirty six. The difference between the March and Two numbers are the delay costs in interest and uh, rate increases, correct? Correct. So, so the middle, so the middle row is the clean usage rate per 100 cubic feet, and just we wanted to provide you with the references to what was proposed March 17. So on the, on the bottom row there in the yellow and the double underline is what is being proposed this evening. The cross out is what was three months ago. Yeah. Sure. Again, and just to, just to reiterate the labor, beat a dead horse. Yeah, we, we do have the, the ability to use retained earnings to keep these at the March cost if we had to. Um, certainly, I think I think you'd be pushing a little bit of the water, more more water against the dam. Uh, eventually, as, Neil, the, if I'm not mistaken, if by by taking a look at the two sets of bar charts, uh, the one from March 17th and the one and the current and the one that is being proposed now, there is a significant usage of cash on hand from what I can see between you know comparing the two bar charts on the right there is going to be more of our fund of our funds that are being used in the current projection than what there had been in March 17th is that not correct that, that is correct and I and how much that equates to I don't know I, it's very difficult to to uh, estimate on the bar chart, so because you know there is somewhat of a lack of granularity, but I mean, it, it is not insignificant the amount that is being used in the first three years. 
I just want I just want to point that out in passing. That's all. That's not to say possibly some something else couldn't be done, but you know. If if I may interject, it, this is Bill. Um, yeah. It's very difficult to determine the the retained earnings that are available in excess of the cash above minimum by looking at that bar graph on this presentation. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, by fiscal year 2023, 20, as presented to you tonight, the minimum ca uh, the cash above minimum at that point is about a million two. Mm -hmm. We project on using almost $3.7 million of our retained earnings over the next three years. So we, we do- Bill, could you, we, could you repeat sorry. that number, please? Could you just repeat yes, that number? So we plan on, the model anticipates the division utilizing approximately $3.7 million of retained earnings cash over the uh, up through fiscal year 2023. What is the percentage, Ms. Patrick Brady? What is that uh, percentage of total retained earnings that 3.7 represent? Uh, well, retained it's 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 a very that's a very uh, um, questionable question that you've just asked because <laughs> questionable question. retained earnings 3.3.7. 3.7 so divided by retained up. earnings is what the percentage would be. Well, so it's but but cash is cash. Retained earnings is the value of the utility, including all its assets. Yeah. Which don't necessarily equate to cash. Right. Okay, so gotcha. My my very, bad. very yeah, difficult sorry. to say what is the percentage of retained earnings. Sure. I just want, you know, my, my, I guess what I do want you to know is that. Between twenty between now and twenty twenty three, the end of twenty twenty three, the model is anticipating the sewer division utilizing three point six million dollars of retained earnings cash as a supplement to the rates. Right. And my question with that clarification. One more thing. In addition, our goal was to maintain approximately one million dollars of cash above minimum throughout the four-year rate period right. and this particular model succeeds in doing that now that's not to say if you say you want a quarter of a million dollars above minimum that's a possibility but that's not a recommendation i would make And then the, the other question, if we go back to, um, thank you, Bill, by the way, that was very helpful. Uh, and you got to the heart of the question, which is cash above minimum, your, your comfort level on cash above minimum. Um, can we, over the next four years, if, if we're uncomfortable or if, the, if you can't make a, a recommendation that we dip into cash over minimum, of, we don't want to dip below a million dollars over cash over minimum. Is there a way for us to um, defer? I hate to use that word, but to defer back on seven thirty one the the green over the next four years. So the uh, the cash funded capital projects over the next four years is there an ability if we're not comfortable with with dipping below a million dollars above minimum do we have some wiggle room in what we can um can defer well i i think that you know on an annual basis the division looks at capital projects that are anticipated and projected and makes determinations as to whether or not those projects are viable at that point in time or not. And so there are definitely some projects that will be shifted, 
Um, some other projects that were unanticipated will move in. Uh, but but this is a, a educated guess by some professional people that, that have some experience. And, um, and and that's our best guess. What you're talking about here, uh, Bob Beaumont, what you're talking about here, looking at that uh, bar chart on 731, basically you're going from uh, fiscal year 20 where we've got, what, about 9.7 million uh, in cash at the end of the fiscal year is what we're projecting? We've got, we've got, at the end of this uh, fiscal year of 2021, we're anticipating, oh, I'm sorry, 2020, we're anticipating about 9.7 million, 9.8 million. 9.7, so. And then we take a look at the end of fiscal 23. Uh, we're and talking you're at 6.8. You're talking something in the order of about 6.7 here again, probably, right? Correct. Correct. So that, and at that point, we're talking cash that we should have for minimum is something in 5. the range 6. of about 5.7 or plus or minus. Correct. Okay. And it, it does slightly build. It, it, uh, builds, it builds in, in anticipation of the initial payments on the yeah. loan advancements and the closing of the phosphorus right. grant and loan. Yeah, that was just, clear. That was clear to me when we had our meeting in March. I, I know we're, we're building the key for the inevitable. Correct. I don't like it any more than you do, Patrick. <laughs> I don't think any of us do. <laughs> There's nothing else at this point then. Neil, if you want to go ahead and uh, put, you know, proceed. Okay, so I'm going to jump forward to 7-37. So again, we will focus on the 5 8 inch meter customer. And you can see in the red box for fiscal year 21, the average quarterly increase for a single family residential customer will be $5.29. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. for the, the flat sewer single family, you can see the decrease and that is being driven by um, a reduction in the cubic feet that we are charging them. So people are, you know, we adjusted that quantity for the flat sewer. So these, these are people that have their own well, but they discharge into the sanitary sewer collection system. So Bill Phelan and I spent a lot of time when we were building the model to look at both the mean and the median use, and it is 1,200 cubic feet per quarter. So overall, with that weighted in, the weighted average is an increase of 3.86 for our 5 8 inch meter customer. That is 96% of our customers. So I'll go back to let's look at what our greatest percentage of our customers are. So advancing to 7 38 as well. We just project this. We also ran the statistics for the one and a half through four inch meters. And remember, these are less than 2% of our overall customers. We did include the number of customers for meter size as well as for classification of the meter. Neil, this is Rick. Um, I note there's only one four inch meter. Can you refresh our memories as to where that is? It's a water division well. It's well one, I believe. Thank you. No, no problem. So, and then just for comparison, you know, prior, uh, let's focus on the single family residential customer for 5 8 meter. Um, the median quarterly increase before was 5.16. That's 13 cents. And now we're with, looking at a little, you know, so we included that number as well, just as a comparison. 
and just we gave you the full chart all the way up to four inch. So that's seven dash forty. We'll go back to this one for a moment. So this is really where ninety six percent of our customers. Now again, this is an average quarterly increase. You know, average is dangerous because fifty percent will be higher and fifty percent will be lower. It really depends on your water usage. But so for fiscal year 21, a $5.29 increase per quarter, less than $2 per month. Okay, I want to step forward, I'll jump forward to 7 41. Again, acknowledgement. Uh, Bill, of course, did the really, really heavy lifting here. Uh, lots of input from Larry Regan, our CPA, um, Jay Pulowski, Eric Kruger, and my executive secretary, Pat Crabtree. And then next steps. So where do we go from here? Um, June 16, 2020, tonight, um, we need the public utility, the sewer division uh, needs the public utilities commission to set a date for the public hearing. The suggested date uh, would be July 6, Thursday, July 16, 2020 at 6 30 p.m. Um, if that date is selected, the town council chambers um, are already reserved for that evening. Then that's a Thursday. On Tuesday, July 21, the PUC uh, needs to have a formal motion to approve, modify, or disapprove the charges. And after that, uh, we publish the rate. There's the 21-day waiting period. And then October 1, 2020, effective date of new rates and charges for bills rendered on or after October 1st. All right. Uh, I'll open it up to any questions. All right. Patrick or Joel, uh, any questions or comments up, Neil, at this point? Uh, this is Patrick. I just don't, I don't have any questions. I'm just, just checking the calendar on that 16th day. And I apologize. I should have done it earlier and I didn't. So I'll circle back in a second. Uh, I don't have any questions. I, uh, I thank Neil and, uh, and uh, all staff for the, the excellent job in uh, preparing uh, the materials. Uh, of course, the, uh, the numbers, you know, aren't uh, uh, what we uh, had hoped for, uh, but uh, we've, been, we've been dealt uh, this hand, and uh, I, I think we've done a, a very effective job of uh, managing the cost. I look forward to the, uh, to the hearing and the comments from the public. Uh, the dates that uh, you, you've set uh, forward for uh, July 16 uh, are, are, are fine with me, and I'll, I'll put that on my calendar if, uh, if need be. All right. Uh, with that in mind, then, is there a motion to set the hearing date? And this is this actually, is, is this both water and sewer? Or just sewer? Yeah, so, you know, this would be... This would be, this is Neil Amick, this would be both water and sewer because if you remember from the March 17th, you may recall, we also um, updated the miscellaneous charges on the water division side as well, such as for frozen meters, et cetera. All right. Question I have then, do we in fact have to have two separate hearings, one on water and one on sewer, or can they be combined? Previously, uh, when we went through the history last time, we traditionally combined them. Okay, very fine. I just want to say I couldn't remember back to when we we had done anything, uh, Neil. So, okay, is there a motion then to set the date of uh, July sixteenth at six thirty p.m. for water and sewer uh, vision rate public hearing? Patrick Brady so moved. Is there a second? Second, Joe. All right. Any additional discussion, gentlemen, with regard to the date? Hearing none, all those in favor of setting the date at 716 at 630 p.m., signify by saying aye. 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 
I stands voting unanimously. Neil, Bill, and staff, thank you uh, certainly for all the work that's been put in time and time again on you know on what you've done with respect to uh, everything to do with phosphorus and now this. It's so it is sincerely appreciated. And please do pass that on to your staff, if you would. Certainly. Patrick Kearney and I concur. Is, uh, the update, which we have on the screen here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. So we will go, you'll go through the water pollution control facility upgrade project update for this evening, Tuesday, June 16, 2020. So we are going to jump right into the building and the facility construction. So the anaerobic basin construction is substantially complete for this structure with the, with the exception of installation of the six invent mixers, the scum trough, and the weir baffle. And what is moving on, mixer? Out of curiosity. So we actually have a um, bid waiver from DEEP for this, and it is basically a gigantic mixer that hovers about two feet off the bottom of the anaerobic basin. Okay. It's got some special fluid. I almost attached a graphic so you guys could see it. I wish I had done that now. So it is a specialty mixer for and for the anaerobic basin because it does not introduce a lot of oxygen. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So moving on to the intermediate pump station, um, the, pro the contractor is in the process of installing seven slide gates for this structure ranging in size from 12 inches square to six feet by three feet. And then um, Main Street piping. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, so just as a point of reference, what we call Main Street, and it just took on a name of its own, is that is the main driveway down the center of the uh, wastewater treatment plant between the RBCs and the primary and secondary settling tanks. So through that, we have many, many existing pipes as well as electrical conduits, and we're adding even more. So we're putting about 4.9 gallons in a five gallon bucket. So the contractor has installed 60 linear feet of 36 inch effluent piping from the RBC to the intermediate pump station, as well as 60 linear feet of influent piping from the IPS to the anoxic basin. As well as the electrical subcontractor is in the process of in installing a 28 conduit duct bank between the primary, which is running between the primary settling tank and the anaerobic basin towards Main Street. And then once it hits Main Street, it will divide. We look at the tertiary phosphorus building. Uh, the contractor continues to place rebar and form, form the exterior and interior walls. At this point, it is actually, it's about 75% complete for the concrete. Uh, the contractor actually was working late this evening to uh, finish a concrete pour. This has really been ideal weather. I know we've talked a lot about can you pour in the winter, and you can, but if we get to really hot and humid days, concrete curing too fast is also an issue as well. So we want to take advantage of the mild weather when we can. And then when we look at the UV disinfection in the post duration building, uh, the structure passed both the quantitative and the qualitative hydrostatic test for the exterior walls. And the next step is to backfill the interior space to subgrade 
and then pour the floor slabs. And then looking at our financial as well as our construction schedule, as of May 15, 2020, uh, the contract sum to date remains the same at 45.459, and there have been no scheduled days as of yet. So our contract completion date remains February 10, 2022. Any questions, I'll gentlemen? Open it up to any questions. Hello? Uh, this is Patrick. I have no questions. Thank you for the update, Neil. Okay. No problem. Joel? Neil, this Neil, this is Rick. I, I want to compliment you. Oh, go ahead, Joel. I'm sorry. I uh no questions. Thank you. Neil, I want to compliment and thank you again for the one what has become the, the typical excellent job that you and Bill have done both on item seven, the water, the, um, you know, the, the update on the, on the water sewer rate changes and this, uh, this monthly update on the project. Thank, yeah, you. Job well done thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I, you know what, we jumped right to the presentation, Bob, if you don't mind me, I want to call the PUC's attention to pages 7-14 through 7-16 in their PUC packet. And Bill created an excellent spreadsheet and I just made it look pretty. Um, we do show the projected increases uh, on page 7-14 is for water only. And then on 7-15 and 7-16 is for a combined water and sewer bill. So that will give you some perspective across the range of our customers as to what the projected increase will be with the proposed rates. So I want to, that, that's a good spreadsheet to go back to. Painful spreadsheet, but thank you. <laughs> Why is it painful? Because <laughs> it's an increase. No, it's a big increase, but it, I mean, you know, we've got to, $55 billion project, so not to be wondered at. So, all right. Well, again, Neil, Bill, thank you uh, for all you do to begin with. And, uh, but appreciate both reports tonight. And we will certainly be, we'll see you both again, I'm sure, on the 16th. And we'll see you before then at the, ne at the next meeting. So, thank you very much. Okay. And with that in mind, uh, I guess we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is discussion and action approval with the post settlement agreement uh, regarding FERC. And I believe, Rick, you'll probably uh, take that. Because what, what, what we're looking for on this is basically we need a, we'll need a motion to. Uh, I need you to endorse. Yeah, or recommend the proposed settlement uh, agreement to the Sun Coast. As, as written here, per all the materials I've provided, uh, and then it will require town council approval of the settlement agreement. I've had discussions with the mayor's office, the town attorney's office, and the council chairman on this, and I suspect it will be an executive session. Mm -hmm. um, it is my understanding of what the council chairman is, is likely going to do with this, given the nature of the material. So given everything that's here, if there are any questions that the commission needs answered be, before they can, you know, make a motion and, and take a vote on this, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. I also have John Coyle on hot standby. I can call him on my cell phone. Um, he told me I could break the glass and call him if I needed to. So, 
uh, uh, Mr. Chin, this is Patrick Bernie. I, I and I actually have I sent the email message earlier today to to Janice Small. I thought your instruction in an email to us today, Ms. Rick, was that we can't discuss this. Well, I've been advised to, to limit it and keep it keep it brief. Um, but if, if there's if there's a need to ask me about anything, I'll, you know, I want you gentlemen to be comfortable with making the motion and taking the vote. Well, I guess I have I'm a I'm a, a bit uncomfortable with the fact that the the town council is 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 reviewing this agreement um 60 70 pages of of dense materials that i probably have spent 2 hours on um in an executive session and this body which is charged by our town charter to act as the legislative body for all issues regarding utility business, and we're not discussing this in an executive session. In fact, if I look at the, the four corners of your email, it says we can't talk about this in public for the advice of our town council, the lawyer. So I, I would feel very uncomfortable with bringing in um, a lawyer to advise us on this settlement agreement based on the advice of the town attorney. Um, and I'm concerned that we are are not executing our obligations under the town charter if we simply vote on this with the discussion. And I'm looking at some of the dates on this, and and for the life of me, and I again sometimes because of schedules, I don't have an opportunity to review this these documents prior to the day of the hearing. But some of this information go, is dated back to April of 20. Um, uh, and I, I'm in favor of tabling this. If we, have, if we have to do a special meeting, an executive session, then I, that's what I want to do. Um, I, would, I would not vote to approve this now. I can't. Um, based on the, the comments in your email about the advice from our Attorney and the fact that I do have questions for Mr. Doyle um, with specifically regarding uh, agendas 965 and 966. Um, so in, in my view, I, I, I can't, I don't, I don't think based on the advice of counsel, we can talk about this in public. I think we need to have an executive session to answer questions. Um, and I don't think this could go to the town council until we approve it. Uh, and and I just am not in a position to approve it right now. I'm just one of three. All right, Rick, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Were were you in work? Am I correct in believing that we're told that we cannot have an executive session on this? That was the advice I got earlier. Um, so yes, I I feel it's, we're in a bit of a conundrum here, a bit of a catch twenty two. And uh, why can't but, why can't we have a Patrick Brady? Why can't we have an executive session? My understanding from the law department was it didn't meet the criteria for Connecticut FOI. Because of the was that because of the fact that all we are I say all we're doing all we're doing is recommending. <laughs> Rather than I, I don't, I, 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 I'm just sort of confused my, you know, myself as to why. I, I think because they thought there wasn't sensitive or proprietary or commercially sensitive information being discussed. Well, then, if that's I, the case, I, why, why, why can't account? And I don't expect an answer from you unless you, unless you happen to know. Why is it that the town council can go ahead and into executive session on it and we can't? Given those criteria, Mr. Chairman, I'll have to give you no answer. No, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be fair when I, you know, when I ask that. that that's basically what I expected. Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, it's, just, it's pending. It's pending claims and litigation. So I, I think that fits in, fits neatly into one of the reasons for us to go into executive session. Well, I don't disagree, but that's not what I was told. So. 
again, I, I did follow up with the town attorney based on your email, and, and I, I didn't hear back from the town attorney, but that was later in the day. Um, what's the timing on this? And I, I don't want to impose upon my fellow commissioners, but um, can, can we schedule special meetings for the sole purpose of discussing this in executive session? Uh, if that's what it takes, I'm willing to do that. It's uh, we need to do it promptly. The you know we're we're a party to this, and the, right. the settlement agreement includes us. And the the other side of this, if you will, is would would like everybody to sign off on it, and they want to file their they want to make their filings of FERC um, soon. For, for yeah, I think it said uh, June. May or June, I think, is that the, the right. overview of the settlement, which is dated April 28, 2020, talks about a May or June filing. Correct. And I believe that all parties here must go ahead and approve it, or the it, it, then the agreement doesn't fly if there is a party that does not approve it. If I read that yes, correctly, and I, I, I may not. Yes, it's my understanding. Yes, I believe that's so. Yeah. That's what I thought I read, Rick. Yes. All right. Joel, any uh, your comment, concern? Well, I've read the case, and uh, I'm most interested in having a discussion on the allocation of payment. Um, I've looked at the numbers. I think we've done fairly reasonable uh, with this. I know uh, time is of the essence to have this um, um, uh, have this meeting. accepted um, uh, for the uh, the filing with uh, with FERC. Um, and that's where I stand. I mean, I if, uh, if, if we can't discuss the uh, the allocation of payments, um, I'm, I'm I'm somewhat in a, a position with Patrick, and that is um, I'm not quite sure how to handle it. Uh, I'm I'm not looking to go over the uh, any of the, the details of the uh, uh, of the case uh, of the. Uh, I call it the decision, which is marked confidential. Um, I think it's marked confidential privilege, privilege and confidential settlement, settlement uh, communication. Um, I write it, and it, it, it appears to me favorable uh, for the for the uh, for the town. Uh, that said, um, I'm you know my concern I think lies with Patrick, and that is. Um, you know, to have a you know a very explicit discussion on the um, on the schedule of payments. Okay, um, my okay. I don't have that much of a problem with it, gentlemen. But uh, as I think the two of you may, but because my personal opinion is, I think that the return we're going to be getting on it certainly is worthwhile versus that which we have expended. Here to four, up until up through 2018, I believe, they had spent some 39,000 in attorney's fees. The 39,000 in attorney's fees are construed to be part of the settlement. Uh, the attorney's fees that we have spent to date uh, since we approved this phase of the of it has, you know, we approved six, 68,000 last year. To date, I believe we spent twenty-two thousand. Just as an FYI, uh, the overall return for that looks to be looks to be, to my mind, to be very good. If you want to have a special meeting, I think we need you know, we need a couple things in mind. One, we need to find out. We need to know a when does this really have to be in. B. And that we that we'd have to go to you know John Coyle on of course to find to find out that B if we have a special meeting do we want to try to still have this so that the town council can act on it on Tuesday if so we would probably have to have a special meeting either Friday evening or possibly Monday if it had to be pulled from the town council agenda it could be at the last minute. I'm just tossing out something. I'm, I'm just tossing so I, out. Something. I agree with those. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, Bob. This is Rick. I agree with your assessment of the dates and when we'd want to try to do it. Yeah. All right. Hey, this is Patrick. I, I wouldn't want to pull this from the town council agenda. So um, I don't want to visit. If, if there's an ability for us to have a special, again, I don't want to impose upon us, but if, if there's a, an opportunity to have some type of special meeting so we can have an executive session and vote on this before then, um, I, I think that'd be the best course. Oh, I agree with that. Oh, well, Rick, Rick, I, I would be satisfied if you would be able to discuss the um, the memo as opposed to this, the direct settlement agreement. I mean, is this something that you would be precluded from discussing the uh, uh, the allocation of payments? And that's the only thing I'm really looking to have uh, confirmed. The uh, the language in the uh, the settlement agreement. Um, you know, it appears to me, um, you know, not being a lawyer, but it appears to me to be uh, very reasonable and favorable. So what I would look at um, the numbers, uh, what I think might be the uh, uh, 9-66. Can you, would you be able to have a brief dis uh, discussion of that? Let me not find that page and and tell you what I think. Say 966. 966. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Um, I, I think as long as you kept the discussion just to Walling, just to Wallingford's share, I think we could. Uh, that that was sort of my inclination, and that's what I was hoping you were going to say. Um. So with that, Rick, if you think it, just discussing this for for Wallingford, it appears to me that the um, uh, our allocation for the uh, um, the first allocation, hypothetical allocation, would be the the nineteen thousand five ninety eight fourteen cents that would be replicated the second time. And then sure. what I, my question was, um, it, it appears as though when we have that. Um, it bumps up to uh, uh, fifty-five thousand five twenty-eight, and then I think the uh, the eight-year number is the four forty-four two twenty-four. Correct. And if you add a nineteen on that, you've got a total of uh, a total uh allocation for the uh, or for the uh division of four eighty three four twenty and seventy one cents four hundred four hundred eighty three thousand four hundred twenty and seventy one cents so uh rick is that your understanding of the the allocation yeah so um and you know based on my read of this and and the the, the uh, uh parties that have uh agreed uh, uh, we would potentially uh, be the spoiler uh, that one uh, could spoil the uh, um, uh, the entire settlement agreement uh, and uh, end up with nothing and or um, a long lengthy case of, of additional uh, procedure uh, in front of FERC. Uh, my thought is the, uh, the 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 allocation the hypothetical allocation called for in the settlement agreement is very fair. Uh, it's uh, um, um, significant compared to the the uh, the cost and and the fact that we have worked with a number of the other uh, municipal uh, utilities. I think uh, plus Wallingford uh, makes me comfortable approving this. Now I know Patrick is is uh, is, is definitely uh, you know without question more experienced in these types of things, and you know he may uh, seek to um, you know have a, a more thorough legal review. Uh, but uh, from from where I sit, um, my non legal review. It, uh, I think we've, uh, from a business review, I think we've done quite well, and I would be uh, surprised if we could do any better. In fact, I, I think uh, my, my concern would be uh, we potentially could 
disrupt the entire settlement if uh, if we if we um, uh, don't review this um, thoughtfully and move forward. All right. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah. tell me where you would like to go on this, because well, um, again, I, I, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how strong pa uh, Patrick uh, feels on this, and I, and I, I know he's, um, um, you know, very much qualified, um, and I, and I don't know the kind of review, but I know he's qualified. Uh, but I, I'd be inclined to move forward on, on uh, recommending the uh, the settlement agreement uh, to the town council for approval of, uh, for uh, settlement with FERC. Patrick, do you want to comment? I, I, I would I would say, although it wasn't framed as a motion, that sounds like a motion, Mr. Chairman. That Mr. Reinbold has just made. Well, one could well, that would be that would be my motion, Patrick. But I'm I'm holding off because I, you know, want to have huge respect for you, and uh, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for a counter uh, for you to suggest uh, uh, what the I, critical nature of, of uh, your review that would be uh, part of a uh, executive session. So, so Again, Mr. Reinbold, I, I, I'm I, hating, I'm hating, I yeah. hate to put you on the spot here, but. No, that, no, I, I, I appreciate it. Well, first off, I, you don't, you know, the immense amount of respect that I have for you, um, and and the, the wealth of experience that you have in this particular area and, and these areas, um, and and the the ex, explanation of the allocation um, in tandem with your comments comments about the settlement agreement. Good certainly provides me a great deal of comfort that the approval of this tonight so it doesn't jam up a process to get to the town council um would be would be prudent and i am more concerned um with process uh, but but again i i would not be in, in any way shape or form um, I'm not going to be able to find the right word, but but you, yeah. I, I respect you that if you had a, if you were going to make a motion and Mr. Beaumont was going to second, I suspect that there there'd be two votes to carry it, and I, under a discussion component of a pending motion, I would just uh, just note my displeasure in the process, um, and that way uh, I think everyone's concerns are adequately addressed without the need of a special need and a meeting and an executive session. Patrick, that's more than reasonable. So so with that comment, uh, with your comment, your great comment, uh, unless you've got something else, um, I will formally make a motion to approve the proposed settlement agreement uh, regarding the, the FERC uh, docket. Joel, Joel, can I ask oh. you to amend, can I ask you to state that motion that you make a motion for the PUC to endorse the proposed settlement agreement. It's the town council's role to approve it. Correct. I'll, I'll accept that. I'll make a motion to endorse the uh, proposed settlement agreement for uh, FERC docket uh, EL 1619-000. Okay. I'll, I will second that. Um, I do have a question. Uh, when, I know that the FERC rule, you know, that, this, that the agreement was was made back on April 28th. When did we first get wind of this? Um, I think in Mr. Coyle's memo to me. Um, just Possibly May 23 or a little bit later. Or, no, wait a minute. No, that's last year. I'm sorry. Uh, June 8th, Mr. Chairman. June 8th? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted, to, just wanted to know that. That's all. All right. Patrick, comment? I just, 
Yeah, just a, a for discussion. Just the, this the process. This process. Um, I've, I've I've got some questions that I have in terms of why we're not approving. Why we're only endorsing, not approving this agreement. Um, I don't expect anyone or on this call to have the questions to answer to answer my questions. I did leave uh, an email with with Attorney Small. Um, I don't understand why we can't have an executive. Why wouldn't have an executive session? And then the timing of this is concerning because there are. I, I appreciate the fact that there is a memo to Mr. Hendershot dated June eighth, but there was discussion on this dating back to April of twenty twenty. So, uh, as noted prior to Mr. Reinbold's mes message and uh, comments. I'm more concerned about process and getting an understanding of process, um, but it does appear as though, um, based on uh, the, the, the discourse between Mr. Reinbold and Mr. Hendershot, that the, the agreement is, is fair and reasonable, based on the, the allocation is fair and reasonable. So, thank you. All right. I thank you. Any, any additional comments anybody would like to make? Hearing none, all those in favor of Mr. Reinbold's motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Patrick, did you vote on or anybody, any opposed or any abstaining? Uh, opposed. Patrick, really opposed the motion. Okay. All right. So the motion carries two to one. All right. Uh, any other business to be brought before us this evening? Are there any, co any committee reports, any correspondence, et cetera? Uh, I don't believe I have anything else. Okay. All right. In that case, no, then. Sir. All right. No, no, um, sir, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Uh, then in that case, I'll uh, push to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? I think he tried to second him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Joel seconded. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Great meeting. Okay. Folks, Good night, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Good night. Take care now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Good you. night.